Everyone who's joining us online, wherever you are, we are so grateful that you have chosen to be in worship with us today. Um, it is Palm Sunday. Uh, we are uh, marking today the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, of course, next weekend will be a wonderful weekend to remember Jesus' sacrifice and celebrate the resurrection as we walk through uh, the remainder of Holy Week culminating in Easter Sunday a week from today. And I'll tell you in just a moment a little bit what's happening at Crossings this Easter. But first, I'd love to welcome you if you're a guest with us, if you're new here, uh, if you're watching online for the first time, what we would love for you to do is we would love for you to complete uh, our Connect card. Um, there is a code that you can fill that out digitally on the front of your worship guide. Uh, there are also some hard copies. They say, hey on the front if you're here in the room and you can fill the back out and uh, and drop that off on your way out today. But we would love to know a little bit more about you and your family and how we can begin to get to know you and best serve you as a church family. So we are so honored uh, that you've chosen to be in worship with us today. Uh, if you're here today and you're prepared to worship through giving and you're wondering, well, how do I do that? Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can give in person here in the room. We have a giving box right over here uh, on the communion table uh, over here at this side of the room. Um, you can also give uh, through our website or through our app, um, and that's super easy to do. And so if you want to worship through giving, those are the ways that you can participate in that at any time throughout the morning. As I mentioned, next week is Holy Week and uh, Easter weekend. Uh, and so I wanna let you know about a few things going on. Uh, we'll have a Good Friday uh, time of worship on 5.30 p.m. or on Friday at 5.30 p.m. Uh, right here, it's gonna be a family service to so bring everyone um, and we will uh, take time to remember Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf together. On Saturday, um, a great opportunity for your kids. Uh, it's called Journey to the Cross. It's an interactive walk through Easter experience from 1 to 2.30. Uh, be outdoors here on the property. Um, and so we encourage you, uh, bring your friends. Um, this is really targeted towards kids like kindergarten through fifth grade. So if you have an elementary age kiddo and uh, you'd love to bring a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a great way for them to experience the story of Easter in a really interactive and hands-on way. And then of course, we'll worship together and celebrate the resurrection next Sunday morning at our normal worship time, 11 a.m., and so we hope that you guys will participate as you're able in those opportunities. What I'd love for us to do is take a moment just to bow our heads and prepare our hearts to worship. Today is Palm Sunday, and I thought it would be appropriate for us to read from Matthew chapter 21. Um, just let me read this over you and just meditate on these words before we begin to worship through song. It says this, And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to your daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and Jesus sat on them. And the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And as the crowds that went before him and followed him, they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We're gonna sing that this morning. Hosanna, it means glory to God in the highest. Glory to the one to whom it is due, the one who deserves it. Let's pray this morning and ask God to prepare our hearts to worship through the song and through the word this morning. God, we thank you that you are the God of glory. We thank you that you are the king of the universe, God reigning over all of heaven and earth, God. We pray that you would reign in our hearts and minds and lives in this place, this, that we would acknowledge you as Lord, God, that we would give you the glory and we would give you the honor and we would give you the praise and we would give you the worship that is due your name. God, I pray that as we sing this morning, we would sing with joy, 
and with passion and with meaning, God, and humble gratitude and joy and celebration of who you are and of what you've done, God. Praise, we open your word, God. Be with our brother Matt as he opens it and, and teaches. God, I pray that we would receive your word this morning, God, that you would remove every barrier and every obstacle from our hearts and minds, God, that we would receive and we would be ready to respond to you as you speak to us. God, have your way this morning. We thank you so much for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray, the name that is above all other names. Amen. You guys can stand as we sing. Good morning, Crossings. So we're glad to see everybody today. It's a gloomy day, but we're going to worship our Lord.
Father, we, we come to you today as our only hope, as our victorious hope, as the only victorious hope for life. And Father, I ask that amidst everything that's going on in life, whether it's a busyness of our professional life or stress and busyness of busyness of our family life or parenting or whatever is going on, it, even if it's just the, the natural feeling of a gloomy weather that, that has a weight on our shoulder, that this morning as we continue in worship, we open your word, Father, that you would 
change us. He would do a work in us, an undeniable work in our minds and hearts because we need that. We need you. We need the kind of change that you bring by your grace. So, Father, have your way with us this morning. That's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before you guys have a seat, I want us to take a look at John chapter 10 together. If you have a good old-fashioned hard copy of the Bible, you can flip there. If you've got a device that can help you get there somehow, then by all means. John chapter 10, and I'm going to read the first 10 verses, and I just invite you guys to, to follow along with me. Truly, truly, I say to you that he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. He who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hears voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You guys can have a seat. As weird of a thing as it seems uh, to many of you, I'm sure, I've enjoyed participating in the sport of grappling. And um, it's actually really weird for me as well because if you know what it is, uh, it, it's, it's a bunch of dirty, sweaty people rolling around together on a nasty mat, essentially, is what it is. And, 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 and I'm kind of a germaphobe, uh, and I hate other people touching me. So it, it's really a disconnect on why in the world I, I, I enjoy it, but um, all the same, I, I do. There, there's this universal medium of communication that you have in the sport. Many of you probably know what I'm talking about, and that is essentially what we call the tap. And what the tap means is it signifies surrender. I surrender, I give up, or maybe if we were in the early 1900s, crying uncle. It's a universal communication, regardless of maybe what language anyone speaks, that communicates, I give up, I, I, I surrender. And it's really fascinating to watch because it's a sport that you often see high school glory day athletes come to participate in. You know what I mean by that? They're, 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 they're the individuals, the types that they were rock stars as high school athletes. And, and, and so they come in maybe later in life, maybe they're looking to, to, to kind of get in shape or something. They've, they've done the college 30 or 40 and they're a little older and now they're you know, looking for a sport that they can participate in and they walk in, but they've, they've never, everything has always been a victory for them. And so they, they come in with that mentality and the idea of surrender or I give up is something that had never really been practiced by them before. 
it can take a really long time to watch people go through this, but eventually, eventually what you see is that everyone learns surrender in that sport. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how great of an athlete you used to be. Everyone learns surrender. And as the ego that kind of walks in the door on the first day begins to get chipped away, what you learn eventually is that surrender is really the only path to victory. Here's what I mean by that. I've often heard people say around the sport, you've heard the 10,000 hour rule, right? About around different things. You, you, you find a mastery at something after spending 10,000 hours on it. They'll say, after 10,000 taps, you begin to find proficiency at the sport. Learning to give up is really the only path to victory and the reason is it's so hard for people to get because the most important thing is being able to recognize what you're given rather than what you can take for yourself in the sport. Being able to recognize what you're given rather than what you take for yourself in that sport. It's hard because I think all of us are raised and exist within a culture and a world that have this never give up mentality. That, that's sort of, it's everything. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It's, uh, you know, in your professional life, work, whatever you're doing, never give up. I think it's, honestly, it's an important thing to learn because it does take strength. It does take endurance. It, you have to have that fortitude in life to do so many different things. But the single most important area of our lives, our eternal future hinges on us being able to say, I give up. I surrender. because that is our only path to victory. We're looking at John chapter 10 over the next few gatherings together and that beginning this morning, obviously, but also uh, we'll look at it on Good Friday as we gather to worship and then as well on Easter Sunday. And this, this, this passage that we're gonna look at and, and continue looking at over these next couple times together one of the most common metaphors we have right throughout the Bible. We've seen so many times this sheep and shepherd conversation take place and it's one that's very foreign to us, you and I, but yet very relatable in the ancient Near East. Most of us here today have only interacted with sheep on an occasional visit to a petting zoo. It's not our normal daily life to, to watch and to see the kinds of things that happened day in and day out that Jesus is describing here. We don't really understand what a shepherd does. So I wanna turn things upside down and maybe put it in a way that maybe we can see it and understand it. So we'll talk dogs. Honestly, it's a pretty good comparison and the more you think about it, I promise you, if I, if I can give you that flashback moment and you think about it this week, it fits in a whole lot of different ways. Whether you have a boutique poodle or you've got your all-American Labrador, I want you to picture yourself letting your dog out into the backyard to play. Do whatever it does in the backyard. You can, you can let it out in the backyard and you can do so with, with all the peace and, and completely worry-free apart from one very important question. And that one question is, did someone leave the gate open? It's a huge question. Did someone leave the gate open? 
The reason that's such an important question is you can, you can let them out, you can let them play, you can let them do their thing out there and not worry, but there's one way in and one way out, and that's your gate. And if somebody left that gate open, it changes everything. Now, let me take this one step further. Let's just say for a minute that, that you, you've let the dog out and, and you're gonna knock out some of those items on your to-do list that you've got. You're, you're in the kitchen, you're working on something, you're, you're using, you're leveraging a Saturday to get some things done. And you, you look out the window into the backyard and what you see is someone opening your gate. Now, my guess is the first thought that you would have in seeing that is probably either it's one of the kids or maybe pest control, landscaping, something like that. However, you look back there and you see someone climbing your fence, your thought process is gonna be entirely different, right? They're not just opening the gate and going back there, but rather you see them sprawled on top of your fence trying to make it over. Look again at Jesus' description here in verse one and two. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Oftentimes in the ancient Near East, they would have a guard guarding the gate, standing at the gate. This isn't necessarily the shepherd. This was somebody else. This was another job description. It's another role. Somebody, there's, they're, they're guarding the gate and they're watching, watching for intruders. But whether the gatekeeper or the shepherd regardless of which role it was, both and, their responsibility was caring for the sheep. That was their job description. That was what they were held accountable for. Protect and care for the sheep. Another thing that might blow your mind a little bit, especially uh, if you're a longtime Texan, I think we have a tendency in our minds to, we, we, we see shepherding and sheep and we think, oh, cattle rancher. It's not, it's very different, okay? I'll show you a couple ways here in just a minute. But we have historical evidence that indicates that they would actually name, give nicknames to their sheep. They'd actually give nicknames to the sheep that they were shepherding or responsible for. So let me give you just two things here to, to remember as we're trying to understand, as difficult as it may be, because remember Jesus said here, Okay, they didn't get it. He's, he's repeating himself twice. This is an enormous idea. And so let's try to do everything we can to, to kind of peel back and get this picture. So again, the first thing we have to remember is the primary economical purpose of sheep here in this day and age was wool and milk. Matter of fact, the milk was known to be the most valuable out of any other type. So I share that with you to say that their goal wasn't how quickly can we get this animal to the slaughterhouse. Now that happened, may have happened eventually, but there are a lot of things that would have come before that. And the second thing is that shepherds, they were not the owners. Shepherds weren't the owners, they were actually employees, employed by the owner. So if the owner was thinking, here's what we need to get out of the sheep for us to be able to be a solvent business here in uh, Palestine, uh, then this is when we'll probably send it off, this is the life. That was the owner's job, not the shepherd's. The shepherd's job, the only thing he needed to think about taking care of the sheep. So, not cattle ranchers, and nor are sheep anything like cattle, but we see an entirely different picture unfold here. Just keep reading. Verse three, to him, 
the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Jesus' Jesus's words here are illustrative, Right? They're illustrative, it's a metaphor, he's painting a picture. So let's ask the question, what do we see here? What is he saying? Well, we see a, the picture of protection, right? The shepherd. The shepherd's goal is to protect the sheep. We see a shepherd who gave attention, right, to the sheep. Called him by name, they recognized his voice. We see affection. But we also see here relational familiarity, right? Nicknames, calling by name, recognition of the voice, all of these things. Jesus is putting this metaphor together in order to paint a picture that you and I might be able to, as well as his first century readers, might be able to hear and pull these ideas out to be able to understand who he is as Messiah Jesus. Protector. We also see sacrificial leadership. Do you see that one phrase? He goes before them. Why does he go before them? Well, two reasons. One, he's leading them, but also so that he can take care of the obstacles and the threats and the predators that might be ahead. The only life experience that I have to really give any sort of comparison to the picture we see here is is my parenting journey. And when I think about that and I think about what we're seeing described here, you know, I would like to also, or at least I should say, I feel like I am protector. I feel like I'm I'm protector and I'm I'm sacrificial leader because I, I would give up absolutely anything for my kids. And I, I see myself as, as that, relational affection as pursuing a relationship with them, depending on the age, it can be very hard. Sometimes it's easy. But I also know that amidst all the voices, I promise you when I'm on the sidelines, they hear me yelling. They hear me, they, my voice, we can be on a soccer sideline or historically on a volleyball bench on the side of the court and everybody's yelling. But I promise you when I yell, they hear it because they know my voice. I've said many times here at Crossings, I'll have somebody come up to me and mention a, um, a completely normal, no big deal, but, but there's a, a, a baby or a toddler or somebody in a church service that, that, that they just, they have a moment, right? Normal, all of them have moments. But they'll ask me, that didn't seem to distract you at all. I say, no, it, it doesn't. The only thing that can ever possibly distract me and capture my attention is when it's my own children. Doesn't matter what else is going on in the room. But if I hear, if I see one of my kids talking to somebody else or one another, it's like laser, my eyes. Because there's something that it just stands out. There's recognition because of relational depth that is there, because of affection, because of love. So Jesus' listeners here, he, he, he says it. We see it, obviously, they're not understanding what he's saying. They're not grasping the picture that he is painting. It makes sense to us because the magnitude, the magnitude of this is truly beyond anything that we can understand. But let's let's look, let's look, read these final verses. Verse six, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. 
So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and he go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The love of Jesus is supernatural. The love of Jesus is supernatural. That word supernatural is really important for us. I think it's a really important word for us to put uh, into our accepted language when talking about the person and work of Jesus. I think we don't like it, it makes us uncomfortable, supernatural, but let me share with you the definition of the word. According to Webster, beyond the visible, observable universe. So why is the Bible full of all these parables and metaphors and comparisons? Well, the reason is the person and work of Jesus is beyond the visible, observable universe. Every metaphor in the Bible, all these pictures that are painted for us, they give us just, a, just another tiny slice into the beauty of Messiah Jesus. He's supernatural, beyond anything that we've ever seen or known before. Verse nine is a great example of this. He, he, just, he gives this metaphor, right, of it, but being the shepherd isn't enough. The metaphor falls short. He can't just be the shepherd, he's also the gate. There is no one-for-one -one comparison. There is no one-for-one -one description that fits who Jesus is because he's bigger than anything we could ever describe, anything that we could ever understand or wrap our, wrap our minds around. So I wanna ask ourselves again, the same question that we did just a moment, what are we seeing here? What are we seeing here? Protection, attention, affection, relational familiarity, sacrificial leadership, and now he's the door. He's the entrance to abundant life. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this verse. Real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. You hear the supernatural? More than they could have ever dreamed of. These truths beg for a why question. As we wrestle with this and we think, you and I, why in the world would Jesus, as he describes himself as our protector, as one who loves us, as one who pursues us, wants to know us intimately and relationally, he wants to know our name, he wants us to recognize his voice. Who are we to deserve that? Why? Well, the only answer to that, one we'll spend more time on in the next gatherings is, not only is the love of Jesus supernatural, but the grace of Jesus is supernatural. Supernatural beyond, beyond the visible and observable universe. I want you to think with me for a moment in your life that felt surreal. What are those moments for you? Felt surreal. I can tell you that I remember feeling that on my, on my wedding day. Not the bad kind of what have I gotten myself into, but the good. Like, man, what in the world is, go is this really happening? It just doesn't feel real. It's beyond explanation. I've had the same feelings every time I've held for the first time one of our children. It's like, this isn't mine. It's gotta be someone else's. Where did this come from? I know my wife didn't feel the same way. She felt like she earned it. She had put in the work. 
made much more sense to her. But, but I'm sitting there for the first time and I'm, whole, and I'm like, and it just, it did not feel real. See, on all of those occasions, the thoughts and the feelings, they, they were beyond logic. They were beyond some equation of two and two plus four. They were beyond words of explanation. And when things are beyond words of explanation, we look to ways to describe them, whether those are metaphors, whether they're other ways to illustrate. We begin reaching for things that might communicate something that's so big we don't know how to describe it. I want to give you a, one of the pastors when I was young, he used to have these things called sermon nuggets. So I don't like that word specifically, but, but I'm, today, here you go, sermon nugget. God desires for us to dwell, dwell, think constantly and deeply on the depths of gospel truth. While never believing that we can fully comprehend it. I think that's a hugely important idea for us. God desires that we dwell and think deeply on the depths of gospel truth while never believing that we could fully comprehend it. I think this is a huge idea specifically for this very season that we're in right now. I mean, as we move forward with Good Friday and we're focusing our attention on the pain and suffering of the cross and as we look toward the resurrection on Easter Sunday, whether it's the cross and the pain and the suffering or, or the purposes of his death, purposes of his resurrection, he intends for us, he desires for us to, to think deeply on this, all of these things, all the while never thinking that we could possibly fully comprehend them. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they may have life have it abundantly, that abundant, extraordinary. Extraordinary or beyond expectation. When I thought about that this week, I thought to myself, you know, when we describe the gospel of Jesus Christ as good news, it just seems like it falls short to me. Good, good news. I mean, I know it's just, we're just sort of translating words and just, but, but, but when you begin to look at a passage of scripture like this and you begin to dwell deeply on who Jesus is and what he has done and you begin to make your way progress through this week and into Easter Sunday, good news. It's so much more than just good news. It's a life-changing, eternity changing news. It's a supernatural love. It's a supernatural grace. It is life beyond expectation, according to Jesus. It's like Jesus redefined everything. He redefines everything. Every bit of what we see here in this metaphor, and as he begins to describe all this, he's saying, uh, well, it's, it, here's, here's a way to think about it, but, but you're, you're not gonna understand it because it's so much bigger. But, as, but by his grace, he says, here's, here's some, here's a little bit more, put the pieces together a little bit, but no matter how many pieces you can begin to combine and put together, the reality and the enormity of it is gonna blow your mind. Although we'll never be able to grasp the whys and the whats behind all of this, the truth remains. The truth remains that amidst our undeserving state, where all of us are in this room this morning, amidst our undeserving state, we have a righteous Savior, a righteous Savior who sacrificed his life 
so that we could experience a relationship with him. We're not going to understand why. We're, we're, not, we're never going to understand his, his love for us, the depth of that love for us, that, that he would love us so much and that his grace would be so huge that he would literally sacrifice everything, that he would walk through the pain and the beatings took him to the cross to die. That's a love we can't comprehend. Yet the truth remains. We're trained in our culture to look for the nuts and bolts how to, right? I mean, I I think I'll, I'll be the first to say that oftentimes we will measure a good Sunday at church with, with, did we leave that Sunday morning with some things that we could take and put on our list to be able to on Monday morning, I'm going to do this. I'm going to not do this. I've got to, I've got to get better at this. Those, those action items, those, those one, two, three practical things. That's the way we're wired. It's the way so much of our life works. But I think we quickly forget amidst that desire and that, that pursuit of those specific things, how many times in our lives when the most important thing that we could possibly hear was I love you? How many moments in our lives where that was the most important thing that we could possibly hear. I love you. I officiated a wedding here yesterday. Some of you may have guessed by some of the stuff that was out back. But I promise you that the words that that bride and groom wrote and then read to each other that said I love you was the most important thing that they could have heard. I promise you parents here in the room that the most important thing that you can say and that your kids can hear is, I love you. We may be wired to look for intentional one, two, three things. We we, we might be hungry to be able to find a, a list that we can check off so that we feel like we're performing a little bit better. But the reality is oftentimes the most important thing that we can hear is I love you. And so today, as we look at this tiny slice of a description of who Jesus is as the good shepherd. As we see just a few of the things that we were able to observe in him as protector and his affection, his desire for relationship with us, all the things, the abundant life. As we leave today thinking about this good shepherd and we begin this week thinking about all the events that led to the cross, happened at the cross, the suffering, and then ultimately as we celebrate the resurrection on Easter, I wonder if the greatest thing that you could hear amidst all of that this year is that he loves you. He loves you. He is the good shepherd. And he loves you in the middle of whatever the mess is that you find your life in right now. I want to invite you this morning uh, to pray and respond, but... I would like for us to just take, and as I I begin, just kind of lead us into some prayer time. I just want us to spend maybe 30 seconds. I know we get uncomfortable 
when nobody's talking or in quote unquote silence, but, but we, just, we just read a passage of scripture, which, which I believe, and hopefully you believe too, is without error. It's fully true. It's powerful. And the person of the Holy Spirit brings it alive. So here we are today leading into this Easter or, or, or cross resurrection week. And we've just seen a picture painted of the love of Jesus for his sheep. So will you just take a minute and bow your head? Close your eyes. And amidst all the things that was said by Jesus in that you would hear, Messiah, Jesus, loves you. think for a moment about the greatest love that you can imagine, whether that's a love that you have for a child or a spouse or a family member. Now, realize that the love of Jesus is supernatural. It's greater than anything that you could ever feel, anything that you could ever know anything that you will ever experience, the love of Jesus is supernatural. And then just take a minute. Maybe it's just a taste of the time that we should spend this coming Friday, but just take a minute and affirm how undeserving we are of this kind of love, this kind of protection and pursuit, this, this good shepherd. There is nothing, nothing about us that deserves or has earned his love. And then amidst that place, just hear the Apostle Paul's words, by his grace, by his grace, that although completely undeserving, as messed up as we are, his grace, his grace, drives the love that he has for you. His grace is the reason for rescue. His grace is is the reason for a life beyond expectation. Father, I... Come humbly before you, Father, as your church this morning, as your gathered church, as those who are here in this room and maybe online, and and just affirm that we are undeserving. We haven't done anything to deserve the good shepherd that you are. Father, but by your grace, Father, I just thank you for your love, that you loved us amidst our wickedness, that you loved us amidst our constantly falling short. And Father, I ask that in some way, some way you might give us just again, like each one of these passages of your scripture, that's a tiny slice, it's a tiny metaphor to help us begin to understand. Would you show us just a tiny slice of that abundant life? 
Father, in the here and now. Father, the joy of knowing you, the, the, the joy of walking in that relationship with you. Father, the joy of recognizing your voice at all times, not Sunday morning, but Monday through Saturday at all times, recognizing your voice, hearing you call us by name, seeing you in front of us, leading us forward, us following behind. God, move us by faith to begin to respond in that way to you as our good shepherd. Move in us today. Might we hear the words, I love you, and respond. If you've placed your faith in Jesus this morning at any time, whether that was this morning or sometime in the past, we invite you to come to these tables. The cup which represents the blood of Jesus, which was shed for you out of love and the bread representing his body, which was broken for you out of love. Every time we come and every time we approach these tables, we do so proclaiming his death until he returns in glory.
Father, we're so thankful for you. Lord, as we reflect on your death, the price that you paid for us uh, during this week, help us to prepare our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, and just reflect on uh, the ultimate gift, the ultimate act of love that you showed toward us. Uh, help us as we go this week, as we work, as we're around our neighbors, all the activities that we do, let us bring you glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys Friday.